Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden, and today's episode is for August 11th, 2017. Hope you had a nice week. Um, before we start today's episode, quick little trivia question for you guys. Do you know who the original host of Unsolved Mysteries was? Any ideas? Well, let's check it out. That's right. Raymond Good Burr. Evening. Through the years, I've been associated with many fictional mysteries. However, tonight we will... You might remember him as Perry Mason. Um, yeah, Raymond Burr was actually the original host. Um, and that's back when Unsolved Mysteries was a series of television specials before it was picked up as a regular show. Um, jumping over to Wikipedia here, we see Raymond Burr only hosted that one episode. Um, Carl Malden was brought in to host the next two. And then by the fourth episode, it's like they kind of figured it out. They got Robert Stack. And of course, he would go on to host many years of Unsolved Mysteries. Now, why am I bringing all that up? Because today's case is looking into the original episode of Unsolved Mysteries, the very first episode hosted by Raymond Burr and a mystery that they covered. That is the mystery of what happened to Don Kemp. Uh, and that was covered way back on January 20th, 1987. Still to this day, well, it's debatable. Some people might think it's solved. Other people have a lot of different theories and opinions on it. So we're going to touch on all that as we review it together today. Here is a picture of Donald Kemp. Um, he went by Donald Kemp, but actually his first name is Paul. Um, Donald was his middle name. And from Wikipedia, let's just get a little kickstart into this story. P. Donald Don Kemp. I actually, I stand corrected. He went by Don. Uh, that's why it's typically referred to as Don Kemp. If you're searching on it or anything, that'll give you much better results. Uh, Don Kemp was an advertising executive from New York who disappeared in mysterious circumstances in a remote part of Wyoming in 1982. Kemp was working in advertising on Madison Avenue in New York City when a traffic accident left him with debilitating injuries that took him several years to recover from. He decided to leave the rat race and embark on a fresh start in a mountain cabin in the Jackson Hole Valley in Wyoming. Um, now, there's not a whole lot of detail out there about what this car accident was. Um, there is one extremely good thread on this. Uh, it is over at sitcomsonline.com. Of course, I'll have a link to that down below. Uh, a lot of theories being discussed there. And some people that are chiming in that are supposedly friends of his, even family of his, um, it's hard to know for certain because there's nothing to really validate who they are. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit more later. But in that thread, I bumped into some information that this car accident might have potentially had to do with a taxi, some type of taxi cab accident. But regardless, uh, Don went through a very big change in this period. Apparently, he became kind of uh, disillusioned with um, the rat race, with chasing money, and decided that he was going to change up his life, simplify things. Uh, he sold a lot of his possessions, uh, decided to buy a new vehicle, and set off. So uh, let's pick it back up from Wikipedia. Kemp left New York in September of 1982 and drove to Wyoming in his Chevrolet Blazer, which I believe he had recently purchased specifically for him making this trip. Uh, on November 15th of 1982, the day before he disappeared, he visited a museum in Cheyenne where he stayed for around two hours and did not speak to anyone. Now, something that's interesting is um, for some reason, the Wikipedia article is removing a lot of mentions about what his motivation was for all this. Um, he had been working on a book about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And that's part of him um, deciding to move to the Jackson Hole area. He wants to be kind of secluded so he can finish writing this book. On this trip that he's making from the East Coast, going all the almost all the way to the West Coast, uh, he is going across what is known as the Lincoln Heritage Trail. So he's taking his time as he's going across the country, stopping at several sites that have to do with Abraham Lincoln. And in Cheyenne, it was actually a Abraham Lincoln 
Lincoln Museum that he was at, that he had stayed at for a few hours. And I don't know why they point out that he didn't speak to anyone. You know, I think if you're there alone, it it could be totally normal if you're just trying to absorb the information that you don't necessarily speak to other people while you're in a museum. Um, but if we get back to the Wikipedia, upon leaving the museum, he left behind his briefcase, which contained his diaries, address book, traveler's checks, and glasses needed for driving. Um, and of course, one of the big questions to come up is, well, if he needed his glasses for driving, how did he get you know, down the highway without figuring out that he didn't have that stuff? Perhaps he needed them for driving at night. Uh, I'm, I'm really uncertain, but he did leave without all that stuff. Um, from what I've read, he did call back to the museum and they confirmed that they had his briefcase. He said he would come back for it, but unfortunately that never happened. And, you know, knowing that he has his traveler's checks in there, his glasses for driving, of course, his diaries, which are probably pretty important to him. I don't know if that's the same as the writing materials that he was collecting for his book in particular. But, you know, diaries, that's pretty personal information, not something that you would typically want to leave with other people. Um, I'm kind of surprised that he didn't turn around pretty immediately and go back and get that stuff. But uh, apparently he did not. So let's move on um, to another Wikipedia article. I just want to learn just a little bit more about the Lincoln Heritage Trail. It's a designation for a series of highways in the U.S. states of Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky that links communities with pre-presidential period historical ties to U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. So uh, this doesn't extend all the way to Wyoming, but looking at the period of time that we're talking about here, he leaves in September. Uh, ultimately, he disappears in November, uh, on November 16th. So, uh, you know, he spent some time certainly along the way uh, to Wyoming. Let's head over to an article at mysteriousuniverse.org to see if we can get some more detail about uh, what was going on here. The day after Don's visit to the museum, on November 16th of 1982, at around 10 a.m., highway patrolman Randy Teeters and his partner came across an abandoned SUV. The only sign of the occupant was a single set of footprints that led off into the snow out into the empty prairie. And this is a quote from uh, Patrolman Teeters. The vehicle was left 40 miles from any town on an off ramp, running, stuff strung out of it, the doors open, a relatively new vehicle, not one that someone would just leave. I have no idea what would inspire anybody to walk out through that prairie in the middle of winter. We considered possibly someone under medication that didn't know what they were doing due to the medication or being out of the medication. Possibly that would affect them to the point of where they would just walk out into the middle of nowhere. So yeah, pretty interesting scene. His vehicle is running from what I've read. Uh, the radio is also on. The driver's door is open. There is personal items strung all over the place, like they were thrown out of the car, clothing of his, stuff that was in the car with him. Uh, the car was being described as being so full of stuff that only uh, the driver could fit in there. There was no room for any extra passengers, which would kind of make sense. You know, I did a cross country drive when I moved from California to Minnesota and that's exactly how I did it. I had everything in the car that I didn't want the movers to break basically. Uh, so it was really full. Um, but a very interesting scene that they come up on here and then just seeing one set of footprints going off in the snow out into the middle of prairie and keep in mind uh, this is november so very cold times going on here uh, despite a thorough search of the area by air over flat open terrain the missing man could not be found but there were various signs of him one was a duffel bag containing items of clothing soap and a teapot Another was an abandoned barn six miles off the highway, which held signs that someone had recently been there and had tried to start a fire without success, as well as three discarded socks that were found in the barn. Um, so when I heard about these items, first of all, the duffel bag, that sounds to me like he was planning on going someplace, possibly for a decent period of time, taking a change of clothes with him, um, taking soap with him, 
and taking uh, the teapot, which the only thing I can imagine is he's hoping to find a natural water source or perhaps because there's enough snow out there, he's not worried about finding water. Uh, he could start a fire. If he had a teapot, he could easily melt down the snow. Uh, or if he found a water source, he could be sure to boil it before he used the water. Um, outside of that, having soap with you, it just, it kind of sounds to me, particularly when you consider how his vehicle was left, that maybe from his perspective, he was deciding that he was going to go live off the prairie at that point, uh, leaving your vehicle behind, leaving the keys in it, leaving all those other earthly possessions, which admittedly, according to what we've heard so far, he was really rejecting at this point in his life. Uh, maybe he decided he didn't need a car anymore. He just found this big open land and he was going to go live off that land and take the, the bare minimum that he needed to do that. Then when we talk about the barn that they found six miles away, um, in the barn, they basically found a bunch of uh, pieces of wood and twigs and stuff that were all in a pile. So it looked like someone was trying to start a fire and they found three socks there as well. Uh, someone over at the sitcom online forum made a very good point that perhaps he had taken the socks with him to use to help start the fire. Um, personally, I don't know if maybe he didn't have gloves with him. So maybe he was using the socks to keep his hands warmed while he was going off into this area. And then once he was in the barn, he would have to take those off so that he could try to start the fire. I'm assuming that he's just using a few pieces of wood to try to start the fire. Um, but the number three socks seems to get caught in a lot of people's head when they look at this. They're really wondering why was there three socks in particular? Why wasn't there four? Um, it, it is a good question. The only thing I can think of is uh, maybe that person was right that he was using it to help start the fire. So he wasn't really um, thinking of, you know, these things in pairs. He was just grabbing enough that he thought he would need for however long he was going to be out there. Um, but I also don't know if he had gloves or not. So it just kind of hits me that perhaps he could have been using them to keep his hands warm. Rod Johnson, who had spent hours flying over the prairie looking for him, later said, I felt the guy was disorientated and I felt that he didn't want to be found. If he would have wanted to be found, he would have heard the aircraft, could have waved his arms, got our attention, gone up to a ridge anywhere and been sighted. Really interesting point, and perhaps that describes why the duffel bag was left behind. If there was a plane all of a sudden buzzing over him and he truly did not want to be found, uh, maybe the duffel bag was slowing him down too much, so he dumped it and tried to run off into cover somewhere. Um, I, don't, I don't know, but they searched for two hours flying over that place in they're describing it. It's perfectly open land and they should have been able to spot him if he really wanted to be found. Um, the big question I think at this point is if he didn't want to be found, if he left his vehicle on his own, if he was ditching all those worldly possessions and leaving them behind him, was he really in his right mind while he was doing this or was, was this maybe even part of a plan? Maybe this is what he intended the whole time to find a section of the country where he thought he could literally disappear into the wilderness and leave everything behind. Um, some people would say that that might show that he's actually not in his right mind, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the search would drag on for the next three days before a raging blizzard forced it to be called off. And apparently at that point, the authorities assumed that he probably would not have survived the blizzard. So it was likely that um, he would have succumbed to the elements after that point. But despite that, uh, they did try to search and they did not find him at that time. Uh, heading over to unsolved.com. Let's get a little more detail here. This is really about his mother's point of view, which um, I, I couldn't find a version of the Raymond Burr episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I did find a newer, a newer version with, uh, I believe his name's Dennis Farina, if I remember correctly, hosting. Uh, I think they recycled a lot of the footage from the old one there. I'll have it in the description box below so you can check it out. But the segment is certainly focused a bit on his mother's perspective as this article is. Um, so what is her, her perspective on this? Don's mother, Mary Kemp, is not convinced. My son was murdered. I definitely believe this. Absolutely. He was murdered. I'm certain that he was in a horrible jam. I just felt it because this was so unlike my son. 
I knew that he hadn't walked out there. I felt that he didn't, and yet the sheriff kept saying that he was out there. Don's mother doubted that he placed the bag there. I believe it was put there to make it look like my son had walked out there, and I don't believe my son did. Mary Kemp has been haunted by two clues that just don't fit. A sighting of Don and a number of mysterious phone calls. Five months after Don supposedly died in the blizzard, he was seen 150 miles away in Casper, Wyoming, not once, but twice. He was reported to be at a traveling exhibit of Abraham Lincoln memorabilia and at a local tavern. Mary Kemp talked to a bartender who distinctly remembered serving Don. Um, so that's about all the information that we've seen on the sightings. Uh, in terms of the information on the phone calls, I've seen the info vary a bit, but here is an article back from April 12th, 1984 in the Observer Reporter that is talking about this case. And let's learn about these phone calls. A year ago, it appeared Kemp might still be alive. A co-worker of 10 years, Judy Ayeo, received five phone calls that she swears came from Donald Kemp to her non-published number in New York City. Two calls were recorded on her telephone answering machine February 27th, 1983. Um, that's only about three months after he went missing. Uh, two more on April 5th, and then one on April 10th. Quote, my son just didn't use his name, but Judy says she recognized the voice. She says my son spoke in a strained, urgent voice and gave a number where he could be reached, Mrs. Kemp recalled. Ms. Ayo told Mrs. Kemp that she returned the call to a number in Casper, Wyoming, and asked to speak to Donald. The man on the other end said yes, then abruptly no. Well, could you give him a message that I returned his call? Ms. Ayo asked. The man replied, yeah, and hung up. So um, pretty interesting. And there's some stuff to be critical of, admittedly, in this information. Um, first of all, what's interesting about it is we're once again pointing back to Casper, Wyoming. Uh, why is there supposedly two sightings of him there? Uh, now we have these phone calls that are originating from there, five phone calls over a period of a few months. Um, the, the caller actually leaves the phone number to be called back. She calls back asking for him, and then this exchange happens. It sure would lead me to believe that the person at the other end of that phone knows something about Don in some way or another. Does that mean that Don's actually there or not? Uh, I don't know. And we're going to come to find out later that it's probably not likely that he was there at the time that this phone call happened. So what happened here? Um, I It's interesting because Wikipedia states that his um, address book was in his briefcase. That's the only place where I've seen that fact. And I haven't really seen anything to back that up. If his address book is really in the briefcase, then the likelihood that someone found this phone number and was just calling random numbers out of this guy's address book becomes very, very low because we know where the address book is. Unless there was another address book or he had um, Ms. Ayo's phone number written on a piece of paper that he had misplaced somewhere, something along those lines. But the fact that that number gets discovered in the state where he's gone missing and then someone uses it is pretty suspect to me. It's, it seems pretty suspicious. So what came out of this phone number? Um, let's jump back to the Wikipedia article just to close the hoop on this part of the story a little bit. Um, mysterious phone calls. So IAO informed Kemp's mother. She informed the authorities. They traced the calls to a rented trailer in Casper, Wyoming, occupied by a man named Mark Dennis. Dennis denied making the calls and of ever having met Don Kemp. He suggested that either someone else used his telephone without his knowledge or that the telephone company made a mistake about the number used to call IAO. He agreed to a polygraph test and the authorities described him as cooperative and were satisfied that he was not involved in Kemp's disappearance. Uh, once again, I don't know why Wikipedia states it quite like that. From the articles that I saw, he initially agreed to a polygraph. He was initially cooperative, but then he lawyered up and he stopped being cooperative 
with the authorities. So um, I'm really not sure what to believe there. Uh, Mary went and tried to see him several times at his trailer. He never answered the door. She did get on the phone with him once, asked him some very direct questions about, do you know where my son is or what have you done with my son? Uh, essentially, he hung up on her. She hired a private investigator. I believe that private investigator got a copy of his phone records, which showed that he did indeed uh, place those calls and receive the call back from Judy. Um, someone, I'm not sure who it was, but I did bump into some information that someone had questioned him. Uh, actually, if I remember right, it was Mary. Mary had questioned him about why he paid the bill for these long distance phone calls, which back then was a much different deal than it is nowadays. Um, and he said he didn't look at the bill. He just paid it without looking at it. And that it's possible that someone else came into his trailer and used his phone. Um, which I don't know, that's somewhat debatable, but uh, could someone have jumped onto his phone line outside of his trailer if they were able to access a phone box or something along those lines? Uh, I know guys that used to do weird stuff like that back in the 80s and 90s. So it is somewhat feasible that someone else could have placed those phone calls without actually getting into his trailer, but still using his phone number. Uh, you just have to know a little bit about phone technology and possibly break a lock. Back to the article, we start seeing that the mother is getting a little frustrated with the local authorities. Quote, he's alive until he's proven dead, said Carbon County Sheriff's Deputy Rod Johnson. While Mrs. Kemp argues the search was insufficient because they didn't take fingerprints from the vehicle or casts of footprints leading from it, Johnson responds the searchers did all they could. We covered from Elk Mountain to Hannah Junction to the Albany County line, he said. From now on, it will be just volunteers unless we come up with a lead. You can't send people out into no man's land. Now, interestingly, I did find a reprint of this same article um, in a different paper, the Sarasota Herald Tribune, uh, a day later, and it's almost exactly the same, except it gives us one different piece of information right at the end. If Kemp wandered away himself, it was out of character, Mrs. Kemp says. He left home September 6th to follow the Lincoln Heritage Trail West and kept in close touch with friends and family until his last call, November 15th. Um, so perhaps I would assume that he had to have his address book with him when he placed that last call. It happened on November 15th. We know that he was at the museum at that time where he probably left those items behind. Um, how that phone book, if it is that phone book, got into the hands of this other person for them to call an unlisted number, it is probably the biggest question uh, in this mystery because that whole piece is part of what makes this truly an unsolved mystery because let's go back to Wikipedia and take a look at what actually turned out. And once again, I have to say this Wikipedia article, just not great on detail. Um, Kemp's decomposed remains were discovered in 1986. That's actually not true. It was 1985 by hunters a few miles from where his car was found. The autopsy showed no signs of foul play and the authorities are satisfied that he walked into the wilderness voluntarily and died in or before the blizzard in the immediate aftermath. Um, now, I know that that date is incorrect because I've actually found newspaper articles um, here at the Star Democrat from Easton, Maryland. This is posted on October 9th, 1985, and we'll get some details. A search was mounted after Kemp's van was found, but blowing snow made it impossible to follow the man's tracks. Hunters found the remains late Friday near Willow Springs Draw, he said. An investigation at the time indicated that Kemp was traveling from New York, where he was an advertising executive, to Jackson, the sheriff said. It seemed he was going to Jackson to write, and he had told friends of gathering the masses and starting a cult. And it's really strange because we're looking at a legit news source that's sharing that information with us. That information never came up in the uh, unsolved mysteries, at least the ones that I saw. And I've seen several little tidbits pointing to this information, uh, including some of those comments over at sitcoms online, which I'm not sure if I should believe them or not. But in one of them, a person says that he was a close friend of Don's. He actually helped him get the Chevy Trailblazer. Um, but he says that 
he thought uh, Don was a very spiritual person and that he had learned a lot from him. So there's several aspects that I'm seeing that are pointing towards this, um, him thinking that he was almost like a prophet of some kind. Actually, here at the next sentence, they actually go into that. He told one person that he was going to start a kind of cult, that he was a prophet and a leader of man. Um just kind of a bizarre twist to this story. And unfortunately, that is just the start of the bizarreness uh, if you actually head over to sitcoms online and take a look in there. If you head over to sitcomsonline.com, uh, first of all, it's a very interesting read. And I'd say if you have the time, you really should come in here and read through this whole thing from top to bottom. Some of it's a little repetitive, um, but J.G. Piper is someone that posts here several times. She claims to be Don's sister. Uh, Don does indeed have one sister, uh, and that's it for siblings, I believe, from what I've seen. Uh, his mother, unfortunately, passed away in 2014, so his sister uh, is still alive. Is it possible that she is commenting on this case uh, You know, several decades after? It's possible. I don't really want to go into this information too deeply because I don't know if this is really her or not. Um, I was thinking about possibly trying to reach out to her to verify if this is her or not, but I, I figured that she's probably coming up on 70 years old right now. I really don't know that it is my place to rehash feelings or thoughts on this topic, particularly if this is all a hoax, if this is someone else that's just making this stuff up, uh, you know, bringing up a very hurtful time to uh, someone of that age does not sound like a great thing to me. Um, but I have to say, the stories that she is claiming here are an interesting read, if nothing else. She's very consistent about it. She literally comes back to this thread over the course of several years and gives a little bit of more information, but I didn't see any major discrepancies in the info. The main story that she starts with at the beginning of this thread is the same all the way throughout the thread. Basically, I was hoping to detect that there was some lying going on by, you know, oh, earlier she said this, but later she says that. Uh, no, this story is holding together pretty well, but the elements of the story are somewhat tough to believe. Uh, essentially, she's saying that someone from the Smithsonian requested Don's body, uh, that they shipped Don's body to the Smithsonian to be analyzed. This doctor gave her an analysis, which she gave to her aunt. She didn't want to look at, but she spoke to the doctor. The doctor said that um, his body could not have been out in the wilderness for uh, three years. He said it was more like between one to two years. Uh, there was a hole somewhere in the skull. It doesn't describe where in the skull, but a hole that the doctor said was very smooth and he had trouble recreating. He couldn't recreate that type of hole, um, which kind of baffles my mind. I don't know what type of hole you can't recreate with a simple um, set of drill bits uh, and a smooth hole. Big deal. Uh, I, I really, I don't understand the strangeness in this hole that is supposedly in his head. Um, but the doctor also noted that it looked like there was no um, animals that had um, attacked his body or at all while he was laying out there, that it just, the body was in what she says, perfect condition. The person writing these posts, who is supposedly Don's sister, uh, goes into potential UFO connections, seances that are happening, trying to contact the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. It really reaches into some very um, fringes and understatement some very strange places and where's some information to prove any aspect of this story. Unfortunately, um, as the thread goes on over the course of years, you'll see that several people request that level of detail. Nothing is really provided. There seems to be um, kind of convenient excuses for, you know, I gave this to an aunt. I don't know if the aunt even kept it. She might've thrown it out. Um, I don't know, guys. If you don't want to read through that whole thread, let me point you towards culturecrossfire.com. They've written an article on this as well. Um, however, they don't do a very good job of letting you know what is fact versus what is information that is coming from that thread, particularly information from this person that is supposedly his sister. Um, but it'll give you a bit of an overview about what, what that account is saying is some of the main 
conspiracy type or fringe type angles that are going on with this story. But for the purposes of Brain Scratch, um, you know, I just I don't want to dive into that stuff too much. Uh, let's take a look here at a map real quick to get an idea of what was going on. Uh, we know that he stopped in Cheyenne. This is where he went to that Lincoln exhibit for two hours and left his briefcase. He was heading to Jackson. And if he was taking a straight route there, um, Interstate 80 would be the route. This is the marker for Carbon County, and this is the marker for the Wagon Hound Rest Area. Um, Willow Springs Dam is another place where I've heard his body was actually found, as opposed to what that article had said, which was Willow Springs Draw, which is much further north. Uh, looking at where the rest area is, where supposedly his vehicle was found, and looking at Willow Springs Dam, um, I would assume that this makes more sense for being where his body was found. And it does indeed look like it is um, approximately five miles away from where his vehicle was left. Now, the other piece in this equation is Casper, and that is way up here. Uh, looks to be about, that has to be probably 50, maybe even 60 miles, at least by road, uh, north of these locations. And that is where we supposedly had the two sightings and the phone calls originating from. So just to give you some idea of the geography around this case. So what is really going on in this case? Um, I don't know. We have a guy that suffers a traumatic accident, um, definitely shows that he has a pretty strong change in his belief system, um, decides to make this cross-country trip, and leaves his truck in the middle of it running with most of his items behind except for things that are thrown out outside of it. Um, Perhaps if he was in some type of mindset where he was going to leave all that stuff behind, maybe he was throwing items out of the vehicle because he was looking for the bare minimum that he wanted to take with him. Um, for example, the, the teapot, the soap, and um, some changes of clothes in his duffel bag. Um, also, I don't know, is it all that common for people to take teapots with them? Was he perhaps already planning on camping in certain areas, stopping in certain areas and being out in the wilderness, maybe to once again get away from this materialistic lifestyle that had kind of eaten at him before? Um, I'm not really sure. But one set of footprints going off into the wilderness. So, you know, his mother seemed to believe that someone was there with him. It's kind of hard for me to buy into that belief because we have this adamant testimony about a single uh, set of footprints, uh, his vehicle being in a condition where no one could really be riding in it with him. Um, the, the place his body was found, I have seen some people saying that that area was likely searched before, so they're kind of surprised that his body was found there a number of years later. Um, I have heard in cases before where that has occurred pretty normally. I mean, I think we hit that at least once a month on this channel where we hear about a case where a body was found where they had searched before. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we can really hold that up to scrutiny and say, look, something, something's weird here. Something's wrong with this. Um, I don't know if anyone else was out there with him. Uh, I'm not ready to buy into that UFOs abducted him and then took him back there and left his body there uh, for some reason. Uh, the thing about him thinking that he was going off to be a prophet is intriguing. It's pretty interesting that it comes up in one particular news article, but I didn't find a whole lot of other information about that. Um, was he starting some type of religion based on contacting the spirit of Abraham Lincoln? That's one of the theories that is being discussed here at sitcoms online as well. Um, what I'm really curious about and uh, wise guy 182 at sitcoms online brought something up. I, he's saying, I can't help but wonder if this was an early version of identity theft and a botched one at that. And I believe he's talking about Mark Dennis and how does Mark Dennis um, fit into this? How does he get a hold of that phone number? Why does he decide to try to call that number and ask for that person to call him back and then actually leave his phone number with that person? Um, 
I think there's some interesting thought to that. The main conclusion, at least, that sitcoms online comes to, uh, well, some of the members there, is that it seems like Mark Dennis was just pulling a prank, that he was just calling this number randomly. Uh, maybe he was, you know, perving on the girls that were in this book that he found or something along those lines. But I think Wise Guy 182 still has an interesting point about this identity theft, but what if you turned it around? I really haven't seen anyone consider what if Don was looking to disappear? What if he did indeed leave these items to be found by others to make it look like he had walked off into the middle of nowhere, um, but then got himself somehow up north to Casper, uh, found someone that he could double for, and then tried to step into that person's life? Um, maybe then took that person's body back to the location to be found a number of years later. Uh, it's just kind of an intriguing thought to me. I think it'd be extremely tough. Admittedly, there is a road pretty close to um, where the body is found uh, that if you do take that and just continue north, you will wind up in Casper. Um, but doing that by foot would seriously take you days. Uh, I, I don't know... You'd, you'd have to really be trying to execute some kind of radical plan and to knock out the, the feasibility of people figuring it out, which if you were going to do something like this, perhaps you would. And you're talking an advertising exec that is probably very aware of people's perceptions and how to uh, not necessarily manipulate, but some people would say advertising does sometimes manipulate our perceptions. Um, at least control the perceptions is probably a better way to phrase it. So just to put my two cents into the arena on this topic, um, that's the theory that I would be looking into. I'm very curious how the body was identified. I don't know if back in 1982, did they do things differently than now? Did they do some type of dental comparison? According to the article that I found about his body being found, he was skeletonized when he was found. How hard would it be for him to have swapped in someone else's body and just gotten it to the same location, maybe put it in his same clothing, um, and then hopefully let the authorities come to the assumption that it was him based on that information? Um, if a body's skeletonized, you're not going to do a body identification by having a family member come and see it and say, yeah, that's my brother. I just I don't think that that is what happened. And if, if he did die... Uh, you're talking three years of him being out there. So I just, I don't believe that type of identification would happen by someone looking at him. Um, did they do some type of other identification? This is pre-DNA. Did they do a dental identification based on it or not? That is my biggest question in this whole mystery. Because if they don't have that, if they're not 100% sure that that was indeed him, um, I'd really be wondering. I'd really be wondering about this. Could this person, could Don have disappeared? It looks like he wanted to leave of his own accord. Um, maybe he was a bit more clever about doing it than everyone's assuming. It seems like the popular assumption is this is a guy that just went crazy, went walking out into the middle of nowhere, and the snow came and you know killed him and took him away. And I don't know. I really don't know. There might be more to it than that. What do you guys think? This is where I'm going to turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Um, a lot to look at. I'll have all the links in the description box below. Um, the, that being said, there's a lot to look at in a very few places. We always hit this with cases, especially from the early 80s and before that. Uh, if it predates the internet, the footprint of it digitally is not quite as big. But this is a bit of a popular case because of unsolved mysteries. Uh, a lot of people have discussed it in a lot of different forums. So there's plenty of things for you to read through. Unfortunately, when it gets down to hard facts, um, I'm not very content, let's just say, with looking into this case and saying, hey, I found a bunch of hard facts that I know that I can lean on and we can come to some kind of conclusion on this. Uh, so in terms of brain scratch episodes, this is probably one of the loosest one that I have in terms of my beliefs of what's going on here. 
Uh, is it as simple as a guy that goes crazy and goes walking off into the snow, but for some reason remembers to take his teapot and soap and a change of clothes and he tries to start a fire, uh, tries to evade being captured or seen by people? See, that's why that whole theory just won't quite leave my head about uh, him potentially pulling the identity theft, about pulling some type of body swap here. Uh, that would certainly explain why he would be hiding from the search party members, uh, why he might have left his things, why he might have left his things behind, either to lighten himself up so he can move quicker, um, or intentionally so that people would once again buy into the story that he must have gone crazy because he left the stuff that he needed to survive behind as well. Um, I don't know. My brain just won't get off that angle now all of a sudden. I leave it up to you. Uh, kick it around in the comments below. Let me know what you think. Uh, if you find any other sources on this, please be sure to share them with the rest of us. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of Brain Scratch as we looked back to the original Unsolved Mystery. I guess uh, that's how I'm going to refer to it. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend, and I'll see you right back here on the Lord and Arts channel on Monday. <laughs>